guys, you turn them into pigments. What do you do with the pigments? Well, so um, what I did was I took over my local scribal guild, um, knowing not a whole lot of how to paint starters. Um, I, I tended to, you know, I, I knew how to do it. I did, did, did about one charter a year through the first 20 years in the SCA. Um, and then I took over this and realized that we needed to um, learn. We all need to learn. Uh, by the way, there's some background noise. If you want to mute mic, if you're not talking, that'd be appreciated. Uh, There we go. Um, and, and so what I've been doing with my scribal guild is I've been trying to introduce small methods of different techniques that are used in different uh, eliminations. Um, nothing big, but every little step, they get a little bit better and a little bit better, and we're turning in better and better scrolls because of it. So that's what this class is about. I'm using zo zoomorphic dogs as my excuse to teach this class on how to keep a scribal guild learning, how to engage them um, and challenge them a bit, um, encourage them to explore their own abilities. Uh, if you want to paint along, there's a paint along portion of this, print off slide five, and at the end we'll talk about what that process is like and why that's important. Okay. So, whoops, I'm sure that's on top. Okay, so the goal here again, I should have jumped to this one earlier, um, is that encourage your scribal guild to continue that learning process. You get those new people in, they just want to paint. They're so excited, they have a brush, they have paint, and they just do something. And sometimes it turns out well, and sometimes it goes in the circular file. Um, and that's all right, that's a learning step, it, it's important. Um, now, if you're not from a, a kingdom that uses charters, I'm gonna pull an example um, of a charter, and there's a charter it's like this. At the very bottom, there's a set of instructions. And the instructions are sort of vague. They, they will give an inspiration, whether it's from, um, maybe some ideas on some different colors. And if there's anything that has to be painted a specific color because it's the part of the award, in this case is a corner spot, um, it'll give instructions for that. So they might follow the guidelines. So if it says paint red, they'll paint some sort of red. Um, but they're new, they have no clue. And that's okay. Um, they come in, but then you get a regular painter who keeps on, keeps on acting as the new person. They paint the charter, they'll pick it up, they're smart enough to read the instructions, they know enough to read those at the bottom. And again, the colors will not quite be there. There'll be more work that needs to be done to really bring it up to that amazing, you know, when you get the ooh-ah effect in front of the of court. Um, sometimes I actually look at the inspiration manuscript to get the colors at least in the right spot. And then, but there's the next step. And that's what we want to bring people to is get them to going on to how to do better, how to improve it some more. Um, that engaged and growing illuminator who's learning, um, using the right techniques. Sometimes you want to use hatching. Sometimes you want to use a uh, uh, multi-hue uh, shading. And sometimes you want to blend it in with a little bit of water. Um, and knowing when, when to use that and when not to use that really makes the scrolls look right. That's really important. Um, so trying to teach them all those different techniques to recreate that look um, on both on charters and to push them to doing originals. Uh, some people jump to originals before they know what they're doing. Um, that's okay. Sometimes it works out well. We have some people who are really talented. Um, but it really, even then, it really helps if they start, start digging into some of those techniques and learning them. And I've been learning them along with my Scrabble Guild. So, that's what this is an example of a class with. I'll show you what I'm doing in each of the steps. Um, so here was my method. For a while I just taught some of the basics and I said, no, let's actually dive into some of these charters. So I, I took a charter and I picked out a feature to explore. And I should have made sure it has a morphic dog. I don't have a zoomorphic dog out here, but pick one that has that on it. And actually the examples I'm using for are one from one of the charters that we have. Um, then we look up the inspiration source and some similar examples, same time period, location, or over time even, see how it changed. We're going to do a little bit of that today. Um, discuss what colors do they use? Why do they use them here and not here? There's some times where you don't put a color on a color um, because in medieval times, the paints would actually, um, one would eat the other and you'd end up holes in your charter or in your scroll. So there are some reasons and you can bring some of that in. And then just using small examples so they're not, they're not scared off because it's not a huge page they have to do at once. Just using something small, you can play with that. 
and try a couple of different techniques just to see what happens and what you turn out with. And that allows you to do some hideous things, to fail horribly, and everyone else, and also get some great successes, because something you think is going to be a horrible fail, sometimes is gorgeous. Um, so it's important in that case to be comfortable with failing. Um, I'm not watching chat, so if there's anybody at some point has questions or comments, feel free to, to stick a question or a comment in. Those are three new messages. Got it. On to the example. So the zoomorphic dogs lesson. I did this at the beginning of July, since our scribal guild has not been meeting locally. Um, we've been instead playing with some of these examples online, and I've got a little wider spread sometimes. Sometimes it's just a few of us. Um, so what we started with is we took an image from the, the Comet 01 charters, how we name our charters. This one here has these zoomorphic dogs, as you can see in the top corner. Uh, there we go. So you can see in the top corner here, <clears throat> these, this really weird set of zoomorphic dogs. They really look like a good place to start. So then I looked at the notes on the charter, and this one didn't have the example it came from. But there's lots of dogs out there. Um, but it's a Celtic design, basically. When I say Celtic, it, it's, um, as Mr. Zelena would correct me, it's an interlaced design in the Celtic tradition. Um, so there's not work in it, and the dog is semi-dog-like. Um, the colors they recommend on the charter were medium to cadmium yellow, winds are green, cobalt blue, medium cadmium red, red pale, vermilion, and a light purple wash. It said not metallic or gold. And one of the things I gave permission to do is to question some of those and say, well, let's see what they actually did in period. And sometimes you don't want to do what they did in period. Um, and we're going to pull up some examples um, for some of these. So you'll get a chance to see those. So we picked a specific feature in this case. So it's not too wide. So we're not looking at everything that's on that scroll because there's a ton of different things in there. And um, given that permission to open up to learn, to, to explore, um, to challenge even what the experts on the, you know, on the scroll say. Um, and not, don't always have all the answers. It's okay to, for you to have some questions as the instructor or the guide. Okay, so if you want to paint along, this is the page to print out. I did some large, I did some smaller. This one assumed a black background, but I did some in, in uh, a gray because there may be some that don't have a black background in the examples you find. So cheap paper is good because then if it's really bad, you can say, well, it's the paper, that's why it's bleeding. Um, and, and being able to explore in large size and in tiny detail um, gives you a chance to play around with how, how um, small you can get your detail. And again, you can fail horribly, and that's fine too. Okay, so let me look at some background on the color and pigment choices. There was actually a study done on, on um, this was on the um, Book of Mulling. So a similar book from the time frame. Again, we don't know what example this came from, and I could not find this dog in my study, in my, my research. Um, but this one had nine different colors that showed up. So going into there and trying to figure out what research do we have? Do we have any recent um, um, studies on some of the pigments that were used? Um, this one had glossy pigments, translucent, which probably means it was a glare, an egg, egg white based, and opaque. And those would be more of a gouache usually which means that it has a little bit of a, a, a whiting mixed in, a chalk or something else. Um, and fairly granular, okay. So indigo is a very common one to be used. If you add a little bit of chalk to it, it becomes light blue. Um, depending on the quality of indigo, it actually you can get different shades of blue. Green, either from indigo, which means it was, it was a blue mixed with a, an unknown yellow, um, or, or, an, or an orpiment. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was mixed with or, orpiment. They figured that out on this one. So orpiment is a poisonous um, one. It's um, two mixed up. Cinnabar is arsenic, orpiment's mercury. I believe I got it right. I think it's a mercury based. But it's a yellow um, and pretty, you, you can look up the color and find a similar color in Windsor Newton. Um, yellows were orpiment. They also used earth yellow or dirt yellow. Um, so a, a yellow ochre, and one that couldn't be identified. And one of the fun things I know as a dyer is that I can turn some of the pigments I get from the local plants into a lake pigment, or, or the dyes I can turn into a lake pigment when I'm done dyeing with them. I can precipitate it out. And those will be those unknown yellows because there's so many. I don't know if it was from a daisy or 
uh, from a green through, oh, green through would be green, but you know, there's a lot of yellows out there in, in the world. Um, skin tones, I say they did all chalk white. Um, okay, so very white there. Um, other cultures actually did it some more mixing, blending. Naples yellow was a favorite to get good skin tones. Um, orange, they couldn't even identify the orange. And the purple and pink, that was Orsian, which is a, it, it's a lichen dye. Um, and they think that's where they got the reddish brown from. So there's interesting stories behind them, you know where they came from. Um, and this also, the oracle, if you can figure out where, where it came from, that might tell you locally where it came from because different lichens grew in different places. Uh, so I'm gonna take a quick stop. Any questions? Um, you got to chat or speak up if you've got a question on on talking about pigments and colors. There's a couple questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, the first one is, do you have a few favorite websites to use to, to look up example scrolls? Yeah, we're going to go through some of them. Um, the British Library is one, but be aware, you have to ask them permission to use something on some, uh, for an event like this three months in advance. So we're just going to go to the website. Um, rather than being on the handout. Um, there's a couple of others out there. So I, I search and, and look it up. I do not use Pinterest. Just walk away from Pinterest. You can't figure out where it's from. Um, any other questions? Yes, there's another question in the chat. Is there a chart or source of colors since different sources show different colors with the same name? I don't have one on here. Um, there are a number of Mistress Elena has been doing a really good job trying to source a number of different colors. Um, I've, I've also gotten a list from Mistress Hillary and um, there's two Hillary's uh, in the scribal world. It's the one I'm talking about the Hillary here in Alciora, um, not the one on I think the East Coast. Um, and there's a number of different sources. Actually, in my next class, I have a list of, of uh, some other sources on how to find equivalents as well as what was used and when. So come to the glare class. We'll talk a little bit about um, exactly where you get these from. This one here, we, we have this collection here from some research that was done on a specific book uh, within the time frame we're looking at, location we're looking at. Uh, any other questions? Okay. I'll go on. First example. This is one I got permission, by the way. This is, this is in um, public domain. It, um, very specifically, can be used without restriction. Uh, this one's from the, it's the collection of fragments um, in this one book um, called the Vetrum Fragmentum Manuscript Codicum Detractum Collectio Tom, Thomas II. So second tome of these collection uh, of pieces. And this is one of them in here. There's an inscription on it. And what you're seeing here is this is the edge of the big P in the inscription. Since we're not looking at the calligraphy, I cut all that out. I zoomed in on these dogs. Um, so this is a really good example. So I just recommend starting with a really strong example, or an awful example for that matter. Um, and let me see if I can get this sort of on top of my words there. Um, so here's where you talk about it. What, what do you see? Um, what pigments could these be? Remember the other one didn't, say, didn't know what orange was. So anyone out there have any, any experience with medieval pigments and want to guess what it might be? What, that, what pigment they might be using there? Remember, it could have faded over time, too. Not getting anything from, from there. Speak up if you want to. Uh, the yellow around here is probably one of those yellows of unknown origin, um, probably from a lake dye. A dye turned into a pigment locally. Um, it's not gold in this case. This is not gold, this is all color. The orange, you can actually take um, white lead and cook it. No, yes, white lead and cook it down and then you get an orange, a minium, orange minium. And then you cook it further and get to the red minium. So it might be a lead that was very common. The whites tended to be white lead uh, because they didn't know what it could do to you. Um, and then the oranges might be another lead-based one. And those are pretty much the colors. A little bit of red in here, but that looks like a, an ochre. A little yellow might also be a yellow ochre, by the way. I'm not seeing as many orange ochres. They usually go more brown, so it's probably an actual pigment. 
it's like, we, you know, it's a discussion. So what, what is it that we're seeing? Um, look at the dogs, how they've got this really dark outline. It, and it looks to me like the, the white's actually painted. Sometimes it, they're unpainted, so you can see the parchment through. But this one looks like it's very white. It's probably painted. Or in this section by the P, I'm not sure if it's painted or not. Um, but the square is definitely a pale yellow. So it might have been a pale yellow that fades in the mix of the P. But it's all outlined. The orange has an orange background on this. And then it's got black outlines. It's pretty simple. Not like what we normally do with scrolls at all. So those type of things you, you, you know, talk through and say, so what do you see? What do you think? Um, and sometimes your, your students discover something you never even noticed. So let's go to another example. Now that we've seen this one, um, and it is very monotone, but interesting, especially like the black outline that sort of fades into the dog just a little bit. So here's where I have to actually go and pull up some links. So let me go and I've got a preset. Let's see if I can find the right one. These are all from the British Library. Oh, the previous one, by the way. Oh, go back for a second. That was from, I think it was directly from the Abbey, from the Abbey Library. It was, oh, eCodices, by the way, is a good place to go look them up. You do have to be careful about, of course, um, authorization for public domain or not. The rest of these are all from the British Library. The British Library has this huge assortment here. Let's put that one to the next page. So we're going to look through them. The first one, two, three, four, five, six are all from um, what's called the Cotton MX Nero. It's the Lind Lindisfarne Gospel, which is Anglo Saxon. Um, so that would be England. Um, 700 to the third quarter of the 10th century. So they're spread out. Colors that they, that what they list in them are yellow, orange, red, green, blue, pale blue, aqua, hot pink. Hot pink, by the way. And aqua, by the way, so a turquoise color. Um, and they don't really tell anything about where the colors came from. This one needs more research. So there's also some birds that blend in here. So I'm sorry about the color on, on these. Some of them are a little on the dark side, but I wanted you to see, here's one dog. We zoom out a little bit. And some of the things to talk about on this one is, why do I think that's a dog and not something else? What made the other one look like a dog? I would like someone to chime in and say, what do you think makes something say dog when you're looking at zoomorphic animals? I would say it's the shape of the head, the snout, the ears. Um, something you notice here, there's actually even a separation there on the head. I don't know if that will show up on all of them, but something to look for. Because down here's a bird, and that's definitely a bird. Yeah, the snout. Yeah, you can see that the bird has more of a beak, and this one is more rounded. Ears. Yeah. Okay. Um, other thing to discuss is how they how they handled this dog differently. Here we've only got the head; we don't have the body. Sometimes look for the the feet to figure out if it's a dog. By anything else? Uh, notice how the colors fall differently here. This is a deeper red, a deeper um, yellow. It's still all very, there's no um, gold in here, no metallics. Um, but this is sort of a brownie yellow. That might be blended, a blended color. And it looks like the snout's not painted at all. That's the same color as the parchment. See that? Really interesting. So look for the unpainted spaces. And here they didn't paint the outline. Normally, you know, you outline all, you're not working black. Here they left a white or an unpainted streak around it. Fine work. And, oh, oh, scribal mistake. They forgot to put a line in on the dog. Um, right there. Oops. Yeah, so they're uh, interwoven. I'm going to zoom out on this one a little bit because there's also knot work on that original, so we have to figure out how to paint knot work. And this one has some interesting examples. So on this one, they put blocks of color for some of their knot work. Um, let's see, this has some examples of interwoven. This is mostly blocks of knot work on here. See how that those dogs are just a tiny portion. It's always amazing. Let me zoom out and show you the full page. Look at that. They have dogs in every corner and birds around the edge. And birds, um, whoops, wrong way. Yeah, back there. The birds have that aqua color 
might that might be an opportunity. And pink. And no pink. Because why not? Okay. Next one. Same same manuscript. Uh, different example again. I apologize for how dark it is on this. So this is different not work. So someone to speak up. Um, someone else. Um, what do you see different on this not work? The dog or the dog shape. It looks more like a chihuahua. <laughs> oh, yeah. What to, what says chihuahua to you? What what is it about it? Uh, short snout, big eyes, uh, round face, which is not usually what I see in a dog. Oh, but it still says dog, doesn't it? Maybe weenie dog. It's not a cat. And it's not a bird. But here on the not work, they literally just had outlines and they filled in randomly um, on that one. Very interesting. White space there. There's a, I don't know, is that painted or not painted? Compare the background. Could be a rabbit. Maybe those are ears. Oh, might be a big rabbit. Hmm, it's not saying rabbit. What is it? Is it the chin tuck? I think it's a rabbit. It's a rabbit? Yeah. Because this looks like carrots art. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. No, I said dog. Yeah, so maybe it is a rabbit. And again, I want to zoom out so you can get a feel for where that type of detail shows up on something. By the way, isn't that amazing? <laughs> Just a piece, whoops, let me zoom a little bit, a bit more in. Just on top of the first letters. But we steal some of that and make it bigger in some of our artwork, and that's fine too. And <clears throat> there's birds tucked in the letters in other spots. Okay, another example. Oh, this one was cute. And badly painted. Makes me feel better. So there, uh, differences here. That one has big canines, doesn't it? <laughs> but they don't look vicious so much as, well, they're guard dogs on the scroll. Notice how this, this scribe actually had trouble filling in some of the spaces. Now, some of it may be chipping over time, but it makes me feel a little better about my work when sometimes I, I, that one could have done with good outlining. Um, <laughs> but it was good enough for this, for a gospel scroll, I believe. And this one has long ears. I don't think this is a rabbit. Not unless it's a vicious rabbit. Notice how the snout still has its separation? Separation line there. So again, you're looking for a little detail. So I'm going to start skimming through these a little faster. Let me zoom out a little bit, just so again, you get a feel for what's going on there. Does that not work? Oh, this one had the example of two different types of not work, where it has the bolts by color, and then they have, that's, that's sort of monochrome blend. There's another one that also has, you have to find it. It has more of an interwoven color. Ah, interwoven color. These are different dogs. I think these are dogs. Where's the head? There's a head. Hard to find the head. There's a head. So the head there just it doesn't look like a beak. It looks more rounded. Maybe it's a dragon. With the interwoven colors of baby blue and baby pink. With the black background. So there's that black background. So another example. Um, and here they have that, but they have other different color blocks all through this. So sometimes to realize. By the way, hopefully you're picking a favorite of uh, these, because the next challenge is to go and paint one. So there's actually a lot of detail in this, as you can see. So one of the tricks in, in learning how to look for this stuff, and teaching your folks how to look for this stuff, is to zoom in and look for those little things. And it surprises you sometimes where something pops out. I thought these were birds until I looked closer and said, hmm, their feet don't look like bird feet and their snouts don't look like bird snouts. It's more like a greyhound snout to me. A different one. Oh, all the rest, by the way, came in pairs. Did you notice that? There are always two dogs. 
and here's a lone dog. Or maybe it's a cat. Difference there, little, little, um, little ears. This one, by the way, is a with blue feet, because why not? And it's actually, let me zoom out to show you what it's part of. It's part of an edge border. There's actually a comment in the chat about somebody saying they struggle with lion versus dog. <laughs> and I could be getting it wrong half the time. I'm gonna actually pull this up. Oh yeah, it's prices each other. Oh yeah, I see it. Yeah, there may be moisture damage on some of these too. The nose makes it look like a dog, yeah. I'm noticing the nose on those and the separation. Not just the nose, it's also how they separate it. If you, whoops, okay. Those are all birds because they have well, wings. That's a pretty good giveaway. But there is a little separation on the face. And that's something to watch for. I don't know if they do the same on rabbits or cats. Again, the, this just doesn't quite say cat to me. I'm not sure why. Anyway. So, I know I'm throwing a lot of examples, but I'm getting a feel again for where the differences are. Now this one I kept zoomed out a little bit just to show here the blocks of color with the, the um, knot work and then they blended color in. There's a blended one uh, and then they did the zoomorphic around it and they changed from blue and pink to red and blue to whatever they felt like. Um, and you have to get really close to figure out whether it's a dog. And these dogs, that's right, these dogs are interesting because some of them there's normal dogs, but look, this one's vicious. Very vicious dog. Because how do you fit anything into that square? They probably got there and went, hmm, what can I do to fill that little corner? Oh, let's take it a vicious dog. <laughs> and the body was just whatever color they felt like. But again, they're doing the white outline, not the black outlines that we're used to on that, and bring the body out with more color. I'm trying to show a little bit of a joint, sort of. Oh, that's a big pause. Maybe it's a dragon. Okay, so all those others so far have been all color on color. So then uh, it's a good idea to throw in, I think it jumped over. I think I'm on a new one. 211. Well, did I jump? Did I miss some? Yeah. Yeah. Jump to a new one. This is another example. This one here is the Gospel of Luke. 875. Um, I didn't get locations as much as I should have on this. I should have gone back and got more locations on them. Because I found out this morning, this one is from France, northern France. Mm, 875 AD, so the Celts were still in France. Um, the, Nor the Norse had moved in a little, or starting to move in a little bit. Anyway, so a little bit of uh, cultural interaction, high impact cultural interaction, as my husband says. Um, it has gold in it and silver because why not use both metallics in the same piece? And instead of doing the good solid colors, they did a wash. You know, watercolor. We're told not don't do watercolor on your illuminations. Make them all you know really deep jewel tone colors. Well, this one broke that rule and said don't ever put gold and silver together. It broke that rule. Um, so when you find someone breaking all the rules, say, so what, are they following any rules? What, what type of rules are they, in, internal rules are they following for painting this? Um, so let's take a closer look at that one. Let's see, there it is. So I think it's a dog. You know, it looked like a duck at first, but it's not really duck shaped. I think it's more dog head shaped. Because that's more like a, well, a duck or a swan. No, that's duck like. So the one over here looks like a dog to me. And this is gold and the edges of the other borders are silver, and it's got this wash, a rose wash underneath the, the back of it, painted in on it, and behind the letters, because why not? And it has all of it, no, it's not worked just in black and white, nothing else. It's very plain. Let's see, if I zoom in, will it give me more, uh, it's, it's looking a little grand. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, give me a clean update, come on computer. A little bit. Yeah, and the, the silver is actually rubbed off over time, you can see that. But here they painted in, in between the knotwork different colors. You notice that something else they did in the background, not just a, 
the black on the black and white, but on the actual knotwork inside here, they would use different colors inside the knotwork bits. And that's also silver, by the way. So breaking all the rules. So, any opinions on this one? That looks like stained glass to you. All right. Yeah, maybe so. I'd say a bad lead job, but that could be time. Just give it kind of this there. It is old. Um, here's another piece from a similar piece of that, uh, another page of that, where oh, you can see the gold and silver better. You can see the shining on the gold and the silver. This is more of a dragon than a dog. Uh, but you can see where they colored in, they painted in with this dark, dark green. This is not terra verde. This is not an, a, a mud, earth, earthy mud green. Um, it's more what they call a vine green. Um, I don't know, I actually know where they get that color from. Research, huh. Okay. Oh, the other thing to notice, look, they outlined it in a red, the red makes the gold stand out on the silver. So they outlined it in a red and looks like they might have some sort of a wash underneath. That's probably the, the gesso or something that makes the, the, the metallic stand up that you're seeing. Sometimes it's, in, it's pinkish. But that red outline is another different rule where you're not using just black. So other things you can do. Um, those are the two on that one. A few more examples. There's only one out of this. This is um, from, oh, the story, a class, I'm not going to try to say it. It's bead. It's from bead. South of England, 8th or 9th century. So they only use three colors, red, green, and yellow. Um, oh, and it's a good idea to throw some horrible, horrible examples in there so your people know what not to do. Um, only danger is they might decide they like it. Well, here's my horrible example. What do you think? Anybody like it? Oh, I love you. it. <laughs> I see somebody does. We say, don't do this. And I'll say, but, but, but I want to do this. <laughs> it was so bad it's good. Um, <laughs> it gives me hope, though, because um, I can do this bad at work easily. <laughs> um, let me zoom out on this one a little bit to show you where it's at. It's actually just a... Uh, uh, initial at the top of a page. Okay, and I think I've got one more. Uh, the Royal Bible. So this is the twill heddle style. This is a challenge, okay? It's called twill heddle because it looks like the stuff they found in the, the big silver hoard in, in no, True Heddle, I think that's spelled right, True Heddle in Cornwall. Uh, oh, in 1770, so you know they didn't keep good records of any of it. They did terrible things to clean it up and who knows what else. So this is tiny detail. I actually started with it way far away. Or, so you can see the whole page. Here's the page. Can anyone spot the dogs? I'll zoom in. Can anyone see the dogs? I'll zoom in more. Can anybody see the dogs? No. I don't remember where the dogs are, so now I have to search myself. Um, now those are flowers. There are dogs on this page. Those, no, that's not it. There are dogs here, I swear. Do you remember this line? Zoom in one more. Oops, went wrong way. Now we're getting down to where we can sort of see some details. So you have to look really close sometimes. And imagine doing something this small that has a little bit, bit of body shape. But that's not it. I knew this would be a danger when I did this, but I would zoom out and not be able to find whoop, the dog again, because it's such a tiny detail. Those are lizards. There are lizards, by the way, on here. Just in case I can't find the dogs, let me get into the lizards so you at least see those. See those guys? Look at that. Those are lizards. But there are dogs on this page. Oh, that was a funny face. 
Can you imagine painting this small? This, this was not a big manuscript. I should have gotten the size for you. Okay. We're on here. They are. They're in one of these little spaces. <sighs> hmm. I can cheat because I took a copy of it. Um, since I cannot find it on here, it is so small. One of these two. I did a shot. No, that was the other one. Notice that little guy there. Okay, so that is it is that little guy. I did find it. Okay, good. Whew. I was starting to sweat there. So there, that piece there, if you look, there's the head there. It actually looks more like a frog. It has a body of possibly a dog. And there's another head right there. So there's actually three little heads in there. So just imagine trying to do something that small, a zoomorphic shape. And there's a couple more just hidden in here. Let's zoom out again, just so you can get a feel for what we're looking at. So that, there's the book of canon, it's a canonal book. Um, so the different canons. And they're just hidden in these little spaces there. What do you think? Oh, and the larger circles. Oh, you wanna look at the larger circles? We can look at the larger circles. Um, up here, I think these were birds. Well, I don't know what that is. Huh. There's more of those head things. Those look like monkey, no, those are lizards. Oh, this sort of dog like. <laughs> so, anyways, oh, there's a don't know what that is. There's an animal. So, there's little itty bitty animals. Oh, and look also, they hid them in the dots. This looks like somebody trying to draw a dog who's never seen a dog before, which happens. Oh, I can't imagine someone not seeing dogs. So, and one of those head shapes again. So there's a question of what, of what um, makes you think, oh, that might be a dog, and why do we think it's not? It doesn't have the same lines on its snout. So it looks sort of lizard-like with me. Any opinions? And the reason you throw something like this at your students is maybe they'll accept that challenge. Maybe they'll say, I want to paint those little guys. Oh, I'm noting here. The, oh, the dark green. Oh, it could be a malachite. Yeah. Coppers, I think, tend to be lighter, but malachites and coppers tend to be more aqua. Oh, that, that green that we looked at was really a viney green. Yeah. But who knows? And one of the tricks to do that is find some colors and try it and see what happens. The next challenge I give my students um, is to try to paint some of these. See what you can do. Um, try to capture those rules behind the color, not blindly copy them. Uh, try a couple of different color schemes. Test them out and share them. So let's see how much time I've got. I'm doing pretty well. I've got a little bit of time. Feel free. Hopefully you've got, you had that printed out. And if any of you have started painting them, um, feel free to share that. Uh, I'm going to see if I can share... Uh, I'm going to go to gallery view on this. So I have a question if you have a moment yeah. uh, for that. So what I tell my guild is, is I, I, I tell them these things because I have found exactly what you have found, that there are exceptions to the rules that we have been given as instruction on some of these things, right? You, even with, with any heraldry, I have found exceptions to the rules mm -hmm. of what we're following. Um, what, I, what I tell them, though, is that because this is a, a, a kingdom award and that it's going to, the, that we do try to follow that, but uh, to, to also follow their heart on their creative freedom because we are also given that freedom. Is, is that basically what you tell them to like in your own artwork, you can really play around and look at these other examples, but when we are doing a kingdom level award that we do try to stick a little bit closer with the opacity of the gouache and you know, those other common rules. 
yeah, there's some good reasons for those common rules. Um, I mean, some of these examples would look awful from that, you know, 100 feet away um, or however, however far you're sitting back. Um, and some of them, if done correctly, explored a little bit, could be amazing and different. Um, so there's that two sides. If you don't know what you're doing, the, the, the list of rules um, are, you know, that you're given or examples you're given will guarantee you get a good result or a decent result. Um, but if you want to explore, be aware that there's all these other examples out there. How do you pull that in? What do you do with that? Um, how can you um, explore those boundaries? Um, and I've got some examples I'm going to try to show you. I, I did a little bit of painting. This is from my class. I have not sat here and painted while we've talked. That would have been possible. Uh, there. So here's some of the things I did. So the first one was um, based on the Lindisfarne Gospel. And actually, it looks pretty amazing and awful, and I'm not certain about it. Uh, might look good if you did something with it. But that's where I explored the using the Celtic knot working with blocks versus interleaving it. And the knot blocks actually work from a distance better. Uh, I'm not certain about dog colors. The second one was from uh, Codex 1395. I have to go through and figure out which one that was from. Oh, that was, oh, that was the first one. So the, the, the gray there, I actually blended it just a little bit. I cheated and added some of those hatches in there. Uh, probably hard to see. Um, whoops, it lined up. Oh, backwards, there we go. Um, but that actually looks pretty amazing. So breaking the rules just a little bit might work. And then I did one of the little pink and, pink and blue ones just because I had to see what it looked like when but that obnoxious. Not falling in love with that, but it's a possibility. So that's where you, if you do these little examples and let them play around, they might come across something that even though you think, oh, that's not going to work, it's just amazing. So did anybody take it and, print and do a little paint along, or anybody have any ideas of what they want to try? I, I like the idea, what this is kind of inspiring me to do with, with my guild is, is when we have some of the charters to, to fill out, to maybe make some little, I don't know, sample cards of portions of that uh, charter award and, and, and have them test out examples rather than feeling the stress and the pressure of, Oh my gosh, I, I don't want to waste this big, large piece of paper by trying something out. So I think that's really helpful, and I'm going to do that with my own guild. Yeah. And it gives you a chance to play around with some of those and go, oh, no, don't ever do that. That was a bad idea. No wonder. Yeah. That one. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's what I found. It stretches you. Again, it's getting you off the just paint by the numbers to mm -hmm. deeper into it, figuring out how did they do that. Where did they outline in red rather than in black? That's one I'm still struggling with. Because, you know, we're told to use a black zig pen. Anyone else? Any, any thoughts? Okay, well, hopefully you've got something you want to paint along a little bit. Um, on the final thing, I, I just did that to encourage the sharing of the results, both the great and the awful. You know, feel free to let other people see how bad you can do. That'll encourage them to explore and see how bad or good they can do. And you can also t take something that's awful and say, well, here's how I would improve it. Um, maybe on the, the one dog that I've got that, well, let's see if we pull that back up. Nope, that one. There we go. Um, yeah, maybe on this dog here, if I'd done a darker green or left the blue paw out, you know, different things you can do and play with. How would you do it differently? And it gives you a chance to explore, and as, as um, you know, Stephanie said, play around. And of course, well, uh, I hope it gave you some ideas. I didn't go very deep into different sources. I literally go and search online and I just skip everything that's Pinterest. Um, there's a number of different uh, references out and more opening up. Now that everybody is stuck in quarantine, they're actually getting around to doing that digitization that they promised that they were going to do years ago. I'm so glad to see that, because it means we can share all this. 
This is Stephanie again. Speaking of quarantine, um, can you kind of describe what um, you're doing with your guild to kind of keep them engaged? What I'm doing is every, what we do, have a scrapbook guild once a month, and it usually meets in the library, and the library has had the meeting room closed. The meeting room opened up, actually, but we've been not allowing it in the kingdom. Um, and instead, I sat here like I did now and pulled up some examples. Mine, they were not as polished. <laughs> um, this one I polished up quite a bit for you guys. Um, but we pull up some examples. I make sure they've got a printout of something that they can work on. Um, or if they're working on something else, I encourage them to just ping along and talk and share. And we discuss things. A lot more discussion than we did on the sharing. Um, it actually took, I think, two hours to get through all the different examples with my guild. Just because we, we knocked it back, back and forth. This, this one was mainly um, Baroness Marie and I. Um, so, Marie, if you've got anything to share on your experience from that, feel free. Oh, other thing I do, by the way, is I set up, um, I've got one, um, it's, a, it's an iPad up above my head here that points down at my, what I'm working on. Um, with, I attempt to get good light. Um, I've done major things, everything from a flashlight to a, you know, a sunlight when I can find it. Um, and we just, we just did our best. Okay, we're at the 10 minute mark. 10 minutes left. So, hopefully I've given people ideas. I don't think I have another slide. No, that's the last one. Yes, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Feel free to come, go and share this with your guild or whoever, or, or try it on your own. Um, I wanted to say, by the way, you are the reason that I use these now. Yeah. <laughs> I have a little box from Michael's that holds all of them. <laughs> oh, much more fit than mine. Mine's a codfish box. <laughs> I mean, I'm running out of space, so who knows? Might switch over to that. <laughs> All right. Ah, I see another comment here. The old scrolls use cousin combinations you would never use. Yes, it does push you well out of your comfort zone. Oh my goodness. So many things I would never, ever do. Oh, that's Marie, okay, um, for my guild. Yeah, we, we did use some odd colors. I'm very interested to learn more about this this hot pink example you talk about. That's the first I've heard of that, so <laughs> I need to find that. <laughs> Actually, you get that color from um, Um Yeah, Koshin is probably the best one. Brazil's a little, little too red. So it's a, it's a dye that grind up, it's a bug. Um, they would have used Kermit one of the cochineal there's five different varieties of cuckoo whatever the bugs uh, with that pigment in them um, in Europe plus the one over here in, in the Americas so it was too fun I see Marie you, 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 I saw your comment so thank you Marie for with me in the first place. All right, well, I'm going to give everybody their 10 minutes back or five minutes back to get set up for my next class. I'll be teaching you how to make layer. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. I'll go ahead and stop recording now. <laughs>